Hey, thanks for joining me today for episode number 72 of Podcasting Your Brand. I'm your host, producer Jimmy, providing learning lessons for you to podcast your brand. And today I'm going to be giving you my next podcasting 101 topic, mobile podcasting, why everyone should do it and tips for doing it right. This episode is brought to you by my own brand, Flintstone Media. So listen in and let's get into it first by starting with one of my daily tips. Hey, it is Bruce with Jimmy with your tip for today, continuing our focus on metadata and how it can be used to beef up your show for discoverability. So now you have a robust, fresh list of keywords pulled from your noggin and pulled from moz.com. So the first stop I want you to make in order for using those keywords is the general settings for your show in your show's hosting account, whether it's Buzzsprout, Libsyn, Captivate FM, whatever you're using. Also YouTube, it's there. Go into your show's general settings and look for a spot to literally add in keywords and then freshen up that list with your new list. Also check out your show's description. Is there a way that you can flesh out your show's description in light of these new keywords and what people are searching for in relation to your, to your subject matter today that'll help people with discovering your show today? So that's the first stop I want you to make is your show's general settings to improve your metadata for discoverability using these new keywords. Now come back here every day podcasting your brand.com for more tips. I'm producer Jimmy. So be sure to subscribe to me on TikTok, Instagram, Clapper, YouTube, all the places, all the things. So you get all of my tips and you get them First, I also want to let you know, be the first to know that I have some awesome pro podcasting peer guests lined up, including Sean Savage, who is a master sound engineer. He's going to be talking about using music in podcasts. And then if you ever need to talk about anything legal in podcasting ever, ever, <laughs> then you need to talk to Gordon Firemark. And he's going to be sharing the microphone with me, talking about what to trademark versus what to copyright. So that's really important information for podcasters. It's all about protecting our content. So those two pro podcast peers, along with a lot more, are lined up to join me on the microphone. I'm really excited about that. And you can join me for a group workshop if you're launching your show. I have a launch workshop. Or if you're leveling up your show, I have a maximization workshop. So you can go to toppodcastworkshop.com. You can find out all about that. And also, I'm very honored that I will be joining some amazing fellow podcasters on the panel, the one and only podcasting panel on the upcoming Mom 2.0 Summit in Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm so thrilled. It's going to be a summit full of female powerhouse entrepreneurs, moms. It's I'm so excited to be mingling there. So it's an honor. So you can go to flintstonemedia.com slash mom2 for information about that. Or if you want to join me and meet me, we can go mingle while we're up there. So that'll be a lot of fun. So toppodcastworkshop.com for my workshops, flintstonemedia.com slash mom2 for the mom2.0 summit information. Oh my goodness. And there we go. So let's get on to today's lesson. So I have a lot to say about mobile podcasting. Honestly, I could go on and on. (laughs) But I'm going to split this into two episodes. So next week, come back for leveling up your mobile podcasting power. But today, let's get into the basics. Okay, why you should be doing it. And then tips on how to do it right. So I have been podcasting since 2014, and the very first show that I ever did was a mobile podcast. It was called Curve the Cube. Don't go to curvethecube.com. The website's down right now. <laughs> or maybe go there. Maybe it's fixed by now by the time you're hearing this. I don't know. But it's it was such a fun show. And I thought that's how all podcasting was going to be. People meeting each other in places and talking together in the same space. But then podcasting evolved and it became mostly virtual podcasting. That's kind of how pe- most people do it nowadays, right? So I want to bring it back to my roots, mobile podcasting, because what mobile podcasting did for Curve the Cube and for Flint's, for Finding Florida, okay, what it did for both for, for me as a podcaster was really help me spread my wings and also create experiences for my audience and my listeners that really helped me stand out. So for Curve the Cube, what I would do is I would take my mobile podcasting equipment, which I'll show you in a minute, and I used to go to people's places because I was interviewing people on that show about how they were doing what they love for a living, what they were doing for a living, what they were passionate about, how the, how the world did they figure out how to do it for a living, right? So I was interviewing musicians, artists, entrepreneurs, and every it ran the gamut. 
ran the gamut. And so I would meet them where they where they were. And podcasting is already a very intimate experience between you and the listener, but also between you and your guests. But when you're able to meet your guest in person, it takes the intimacy and the relationship building and the connection to just a whole nother level. And that I learned by doing Curve the Cube. I mean, I sat across the table from people who I, to this day, can call friends. People to to this day will, will ring me up and say, hey, I have somebody who wants to start a podcast and I thought of you because exactly that. They had an experience with me that was very intimate and we were friends because of it. I sat across from a congresswoman, okay, doing that show. It was a different level. And speaking of that, by meeting people in their place, instead of just doing what probably 90% of the podcast is out, maybe more, and they're saying, hey, let's talk over virtual, here's the link. By meeting somebody in a, in their space, an A space that's relevant for them, but especially if you can do it in their space, like their art studio, for example, it makes your show more of an experience rather than just an interview, even more than just a conversation. It makes an experience for your guest. And then one other thing that I learned, which I really feel like is an, a, a, a reason, extra reason why you should dive into it. You should really consider doing this. It doesn't have to be every every episode. Like I did it every episode of Curve the Cube. This does not have to be every, every episode. This can be every once in a while. Okay. If someone's local to you, take advantage and meet them in person. Because one, one thing I found, especially if you meet them in their space, it can add so much to the flavor of the episode so much to the context of the conversation. There was a time, for example, Darius Murray was, a, was on an episode of Curve the Cube and I interviewed him in his office. He worked with pairing up people on the autism spectrum, young people with mentors. And so in his office, I saw he had a bunch of Marvel stuff. And so that got brought into the conversation in really amazing and elegant ways that just would not have happened had I not been in that space to see it. So meeting people in their space can be so phenomenal. And this should not be a surprise, but as another example, I went to an art studio to meet a gentleman who did unbelievably beautiful underwater art, underwater photography. So be able to see that and be able to then ask certain questions instead of just doing the research and finding the images on, on the website, be able to see the, how grand the, the photo was and the details and things like that. You can't do that. And obviously that's not intended to translate if, if especially if it's audio only not intended to necessarily translate the visuals, but the visuals inspire the questions, the visuals inspire the conversation the visuals add ambiance and play into the theater of the mind because you can explain and describe where you are. You can talk about what their place even smelled like. You can't do that if you don't meet them there. So that's a very unique essence of mobile podcasting that just takes it to such a beautiful level. So I really want to encourage that. Now, I thought I knew everything. <laughs> to curve the cube. I thought I knew it when it comes to mobile podcasting. But then this other show idea came a knocking from my co-host, Glenn. He said, I want to go explore Florida, but I don't want to just talk about it. I actually want to go and do it. So we put together this show called Finding Florida, which you can find at findingfloridapodcast.com. And look at the pictures. They're crazy. But we went all over the place. We took the show. Instead of talking about Daytona or instead of talking about Tampa, we went to Daytona. We went to Tampa. We went to Miami. And we did all these things. We interacted with people in person. So this is unique, right? Most travel adventure shows are talking about travel from studio. <laughs> so this really, really helped us stand out. People felt like no, not even that they felt like we intended for it to be us taking our listeners on an, the adventure with us. And it was comical and it was just, it was such a unique experience. So we really, really stood out. Also, by doing mobile podcasting, by going out, by doing an adventure, by going around the thing, we, in this context, in a, in a show where we're going from place to place to place, instead of just meeting somebody in one spot like Curve the Cube, Finding Floor, we're going to place to place to place. So that allowed for some awesome, awesome random moments that ended up being some of our most golden moments on the show. 
For example, we did not plan to run into three amazing and hilarious and very inebriated women <laughs> at Disney, but we did. <laughs> and we interviewed them, and it was awesome. And that opportunity would never have happened on a virtual show. It never would have happened. <laughs> also, we did we we covered the Miami Boat Show, so we went down to Miami and we went to the big convention center. They uh, they conference they had all these boats. It was beautiful, right? But we noticed this one family walking around with hats that looked like squids. They all had squid hats, and they call themselves the Squid Heads, and they're walking around. So they were hilarious, and we said, "Oh my gosh, they are characters. We want them on the show," and we interviewed them right there and then and so they became listeners our, our our already listeners became fans of theirs it was a amazingly funny moment of the show again because we were there that would not have happened had we not been there so there's so many opportunities that you can't duplicate in, unless you're actually at a spot and, and last but not least and i hope this if i haven't convinced you yet hopefully this does so <laughs> there were also extra funny moments. I had a co-host for Finding Florida. I did not for Curve the Cube, but for Finding Florida, I did. Glenn, shout out to Glenn. Glenn the Geek of Horse Radio Network. And there were some extra funny moments that got captured because we had recorders with us in between things. So as an example, there was one time when we were in Central Florida. We are going to um, an aerospace museum. It was amazing, right? But it was also amazingly hot. <laughs> very very hot that day so we get to the museum and there's a fairly empty parking lot it was like middle of a weekday or something like an off off time so fairly empty parking lot and so glenn's driving it's where does he park where do you naturally park you would think the closest parking spot to the door oh no 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 sir <laughs> i looked at him i said can you please park down over there and he looks at the parking spot i was pointing to which was quite a ways down and he looks at me he's like why the heck would i want to park over there and i said um because that spot's under the shade and i'm chocolate <laughs> i don't want to melt and we had our recorders going when this was going on and we put it in the show and it was hilarious and that, <laughs> that moment would not have happened that little insight into the ridiculousness of our relationship into our differences into just a moment of realness on the show it wouldn't have happened if we didn't have an opportunity by through mobile podcasting so now obviously curve the cube and finding florida were two shows that were all mobile 100 percent practically mobile podcasts i mean finding florida had an introductory episode that led, led into each adventure so that one was done virtually but for the most part, the main meat of Finding Florida and most every episode of Curve the Cube was done as a mobile podcasting experience. So that doesn't necessarily mean what I'm advocating here. That doesn't have to be what you do. But at least consider doing a mobile podcast episode here and there to throw in something fresh for your audience. Now, in the next episode, in episode 73, I'll get into how to level up. And that'll cover a lot of the extra power of the impact of this. Like, by doing mobile podcasting, I'm telling you, your podcasting levels up tenfold, okay? Your relationships tenfold, the opportunities tenfold. So I will talk about all that on the next episode. You'll get into it. But you really, really should consider it. Like next level networking, you don't... Oh, here's why. Let me just say this real brief. This, and the Squid People was a perfect example. <laughs> Because while we were interviewing them, guess what? Everybody around us was watching. So they were we were interacting even passively with all these other people who became curious about who the heck we were. And so they became interested. In, and I'm sure we caught a couple extra listeners, too. So it's an immersive experience for your for your guests. It's um a, a engaging experience for all of those around you if there are other people around you. So it's just great. So, all right. I hope I've convinced you. <laughs> I hope I've convinced you. So now let me give you a few tips for doing it right. All right. So first of all, dynamic microphones are an absolute must, an absolute must, because what the difference between an, uh, a dynamic microphone and then the other main kind of microphone, which is condenser, condenser is built to pick up 
the entirety of the room. Dynamic microphone is picked up, is built to pick up what's right in front of it. So especially if you're doing mobile podcasting, you have less control of your environment and stuff like that. So you want to have as much of ability to control what the mic is picking up as possible. So dynamic microphones are a must. Now, I have a couple of dynamic microphones that I wanted to bring with me. Now, these have been stuffed in my Finding Florida bag, so they have a little bit of of the, the stuffing from the bottom of the bag still on them, but they're dynamic microphones. They're not expensive microphones. You know, you don't want to bring expensive microphones on the road with you. God forbid they get lost, damaged, broken, you know, but you can get good enough microphones. You also want to make sure that you have have your windscreen on your microphones all the time so that it cuts out. Again, if you're doing mobile podcasting, you're not as able to control the environment. It's a little, little less, a lot less predictable. Not even a little less predictable. It's a lot less predictable. All right. So have as much control as you can. A windscreen is a simple and very, very cheap way to add a little bit extra control over your sound. So also, I want to mention in terms of equipment, you want to have a mobile recorder. Okay. You do not want to. <laughs> lug around your laptop when you are doing mobile podcasting. First of all, you don't want to drop that thing because that would be a disaster. Okay. Second of all, it's not convenient. Okay. So you don't want to do that. There are lots of op uh, options for mobile podcasting. What I've used since forever, thanks again to my friend Scotty Fusion, who gifted me this years ago, is my tried and trusty Tascam DR40. It looks like it belongs in the, in the Ghostbusters uh, kit, but it doesn't. It's not made for capturing ghosts, it's meant for capturing your, your voice, but it's a Tascam DR40. And I absolutely love this thing. It uses XLR connections to go to your microphones. You want a dynamic microphone, XLR connections into your mobile recorder. You also can use a Zoom PodTrack device, PodTrack P4, P6. Those are great options as well um, on the market. So about the same price point too. So if you go to flintstonemedia.com, you can go to my equipment guide. I'll put a link in the show notes, but flintstonemedia.com, there's a link in the very top menu to my equipment guide or flintstonemedia.com slash equipment guide, whatever. <laughs> and you'll actually be able to see a bunch of my recommendations for mobile podcasting. So this is something you want to consider and you want to see what equipment I've used and what else I've recommended over the years. It's right there at my equipment guide at flintstonemedia.com. Okay. Now, Moving on from the equipment, okay? So now you have the equipment, now you're going to your space. You want to find out from your guest as much information as you can about the space and then also recommend some things. So you want to see, keep in mind, ambiance is your friend when you're doing mobile podcasting. That's another part, actually, it's something I didn't mention. Another part of the magic of mobile podcasting is it it's that much more immersive for your listeners because they feel like they're in the environment. Maybe I did mention that. I don't know. But anyways, but ambiance is your friend, but too much is just bad audio. So you need to keep it minimized. So by being able to communicate with your guest ahead of time, what environment will be best suited for that is going to be really helpful. So ask them to help you find if then if you're going to their studio or their office or something like that, say, you know, we're going to look for a room that is smaller rather than larger, if possible, that has softer surfaces rather than harder surfaces, if possible. Smaller makes your voice will be less cavernous. The softer the surfaces, the less echo you're going to have. So think smaller, not larger. Think softer, not harder. Okay. And so if you communicate that to your guests, then they can maybe help you ahead of time finding, predicting what would be a good spot. So once you get there, though, let's say you're indoors and so you're looking around. And so you just want to also scan that room before you get started as you're setting up. Scan that room for any possibilities for interruptions. Meaning, if there's another door <laughs> that leads into that room, you want to ask your guests, say, hey, do people, will, will anybody be walking into that room? How can we assure that no one's going to walk into that room? Where does that room go? Where does that room lead? Right. And just ask them that. Make sure that. Are there any telephones or anything else? Just scan for any possible reasons why you and your guest may be interrupted during the course of the interview so you can get rid of them and minimize them and all that. Right. Okay, so you have your equipment, dynamic microphone, portable recorder, XLR cables, windscreen on your mics. You have worked out an environment as much as you can. Let's say, though, you can't, there's no outdoor or indoor environment for you. You have to do this one outside. Okay, so that can be a really tricky thing. I've done it multiple, multiple times, sometimes 
much more successfully than others. Okay, so this is what I have learned. You want to try to find a, a space where fewer people are going to be walking by because you don't want their voices overpowering yours as they walk by. It'll be like, it'll be like this and then it'll be part of your audio. You don't want that. Okay. You also want to not have them asking about what's going on. It's one thing if you're out and about and people, you're at a conference or something like that, people know not to interrupt. But if they see something randomly happening on a street corner, they're going to interrupt and ask you. So you want to make sure that that's not going to happen. So avoid those kind of situations, environments, okay? <laughs> you don't want random people ask you what's going on. Eh, maybe you do. Whatever. It's happened to me before. It's not a big deal. Not the end of the world. Also, be mindful. Take note. So indoors, you want to scan for any possible possibilities of interruptions. And that's important outdoors as well. But <laughs> you also want to think about where is the noise that you don't want going to be coming from? What is a sort? What is the source of noise that's going to be disruptive? So for example, if you're near a street, then you're going to have traffic noise. Or if, for example, you're outside, it's a very windy day, you have the wind noise. So wherever that noise is coming from, whatever the direction of the wind is coming from, wherever the direction of the traffic is coming from, use your body as a shield. Okay, put the microphone between yourself and the source of the noise it's going to deaden that noise, not completely, but dramatically. And so you want to do that. Another thing that we can do, and this actually is a, this actually is something we did indoors at a place that was very, very loud. Um, and there are people all over. So we found a con uh, the hallway that led to the bathrooms, this is extreme action sports in Broward, Florida. There was a, a hallway, a short hallway that led to the bathrooms where there was concrete, a concrete wall on one side. So what we did was we stood in between in that hallway so that the concrete wall even though it was concrete it still blocked all the sound from everyone having fun and playing around that was right on the other side of that wall so we use that wall as a shield so look for uh, objects you can use as shields but use your body as a shield too it's probably your best option sometimes you even just put your hand right next to the microphone and that can help block some wind to help block some other sound sources as well. So using your body as a shoot, as a shield, impromptu objects as shields for, to help isolate your sound and pick up better sound quality is going to be so, so important. Okay. Here's another tip, right? Let's say you're indoors. Let's bring it back inside. Let's say you're using mic stands. You brought, brought some mic stands along, right along. Okay. Here's what I often find. And this works all the time. <laughs> it's all the time. No matter how seasoned your guest might be on the microphone, you're the one setting it up. Okay. So they're expecting you to set it up properly as you need it to be set up. So if you set it up where your, your microphone, their microphone is a foot or two into the table, they may not move it. So you want to make sure that you set up your microphone towards the edge of the table and facing them. So they don't have to lean over really far to get in front of that microphone because if they have to, they're not going to, they're going to be pretty far away and they're going to stay pretty far away and that's going to compromise your sound. So you want to have the microphone set up right next to the edge of the table and then instruct the guest to position their mouth properly, most likely about an inch away from the top of the, of the microphone, but you have to know your own mic to know exactly the positioning that works best, but typically about an inch away from the top. If you are not using, oh, and also, by the way, if you're on a table and you're using mic stands for the love of all that's holy, please ask your guest not to tap the table <laughs> and don't touch the microphone because those table taps will get picked up in the, through the mic stand, through the vibrations into the microphone. So please advise your guest not to touch the mic, not to tap the table. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now let's say you're standing up and you are not using mic stands or you're sitting comfortably on a couch or something, whatever, but you're not using mic stands, okay? So let's say you have one microphone for you and one microphone for your guest. What I do not recommend you do is to say, actually, this is one of my daily tips. I do not recommend you say, here, guest, hold the microphone. Because what happens is most likely they're not used to holding a microphone. So most likely we're going to do what we do as humans. That arm is going to slowly drop and that microphone is going to slowly move away from their mouth and the audio is going to 
be less and less high quality. So you want to hold the microphone for your guest. So it's not an issue. Okay, be the pro hold the mic for both of you. Now, let's say there's a guest and you have a co host, but you only have two microphones. What should you do? So what I would highly recommend you do is still again, hold the microphone for your guest, switch of hands, hold the microphone for your guest. Then for the microphone between you and your co-host, you're going to hold the microphone for your co-host. The reason is because you know when you need to speak and you'll just turn the mic towards yourself and you'll start talking. But you don't know when your co-host needs to speak. So in order for your co-host not to have to signal you, by the way, co-host, signal them like a little elbow tap or something like that. (laughs) But otherwise, you don't really want your co-host to have to signal you. So hold the microphone towards your co-host. That way they know that they can chime in and talk whenever they need to without having to signal you. Okay. Then again, when you need to talk, you know you. You just move the mic towards you and you start talking. It's easy peasy. So hold the mic for your co-host. Hold the mic for your guest. Be the pro. And last but not least, always, 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 at least if you can, time permitting, do a test recording ahead of time. In mobile podcasting, environments change every single time. So just do a test recording, make sure everything's working, there are no gremlins who've crawled into the system, and the sound quality is up to par. Now let's end with one more of my daily tips. Again, be sure that you're following me on TikTok, Clapper, YouTube, Instagram, all the social media so you get all the tips and you get them first. And if there's anything that you want me to address in a tip or you want me to address in an episode, please just email me. I'm happy to do so. Jemmy, J-A-I-M-E at flintstonemedia.com. Or if you want your show featured in my These are the awesome shows that are growing with this podcast section of my podcast page at podcastingyourbrand.com. Just email me too. Let me know that you are listening to the show and the show is helping you and we will feature you on that section of the website. So, all right, it's producer Jemmy signing off for now before we get to one more extra daily tip for you. But remember, the only thing more powerful than your voice is your spirit to use it. So turn that mic on. Now, here's another daily tip. Hey, it is producer Jemmy with your tip for today, continuing to explore how metadata can help beef up your show discoverability. Now, you've already supercharged the discoverability of your show on the platforms. Now let's repeat that impact in Google. Let's get the content on your show to rank higher in Google. Now how you do that is take all the effort for creating those more SEO friendly, robust descriptions that you created for each episode. Let's get them on your website. Now how you're gonna do that is by creating a blog post for each and every single episode. What that's gonna do is cause Google to say, hey, there's more relevant stuff on this website relevant to the subject matter. And also by doing it for every single episode, you're telling Google that your site is kept up to date and fresh. Another reason why Google rank it even higher. Now your blog post should have the title, the description, a link section, and of course, a player to actually play the episode right then and there. And that'll help beef up your SEO and your rankings on Google. Come back here every day, podcastingyourbrand.com. I'm producer Jenny. Flintstone Media has been building brands through the power of podcasting since 2014, serving as an award-winning and highly resourceful podcast production house and consultancy firm. Work with producer Jemmy, a leader in the podcast industry, and add a new podcast to your brand's content offerings. From show development and setup through recording and distribution, producer Jemmy and her team will lend their experience launching dozens of successful podcasts and producing thousands of episodes, making creating your show a simple and easy turnkey process for you. Visit FlintstoneMedia.com for podcast samples. That's FlintstoneMedia.com.